Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Amanda Wellesley here from the Victorian Building Authority. Uh, welcome to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, um, we will be answering questions uh, at the end of the session today. We've reserved a bit of time for that. So just want to draw your attention to uh, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you're welcome to uh, um, ask any questions uh, throughout the, uh, the session today. Uh, and Andrew and Wing will do their best to, uh, to cover off as many of those as possible. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand you over to Andrew Cellini, State Building Surveyor. Uh, thanks, Amanda, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, really delighted to see so many of you online for um, this being our, our first uh, masterclass um, of the Practitioner Education Series. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and the elders from other communities who may be here today. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, DBA's first Practitioner Education Series for 2021. Following the ESM uh, webinars in 2020, we listened to your feedback and realised that building pr practitioners are keen to hear more from subject matter experts and uh, from the VBA. Um, we've worked together with organisations to bring you this tailored uh, practitioner education series and we encourage you to attend as many of uh, these sessions as possible. Uh, our, our intent is to communicate more with uh, practitioners and, and industry and provide education opportunities, um, not only by BBA delivery, but by other industry uh, organisations. Uh, and we're, we're hoping that we will feed in some of our findings from audits and inspections, uh, uh, which may identify learning needs for, for industry. Uh, so we, we're quite excited with this uh, and hope to evolve the um, education opportunities for, for all in the industry. Uh, as mentioned, uh, these sessions will be recorded and will be available for viewing on, online uh, on our YouTube channel. And uh, you can also submit your questions through Zoom. Uh, our presenter today is Dr. Wang Po. Uh, Wang has um, authored and published many research and journal papers, design guides, and has been involved in the fire safety area since the in inception of performance solutions. Uh, he's now responsible for advising the VBA on a range of strategic issues uh, relating to fire safety in the building industry, uh, regulatory frameworks, pr practitioner competencies, and key stakeholder relationships. And uh, his, his role has increased our regulatory oversight in the critical area of building safety and raising awareness throughout the industry. Uh, and he's certainly a welcome team to the uh, Office of the State Building Surveyor. So, uh, uh, Wang's involvement in fire safety engineering first began at uh, BHP uh, research in the 1980s. Uh, and a lot of his work um, actually went into the formulation of a lot of the um, building code provisions uh, around fire rating of, of steel work and, um, and those requirements. Uh, he went on to being uh, the leader of a fire engineering team formulating practical cost-effective fire engineering solutions for various types of buildings. Uh, in today's um, presentation, we'll delve into the core principles of performance solutions, including what, uh, why, and how, how to. Um, to ensure a good foundation is laid uh, for designs. Uh, he'll also discuss what designers need to consider and how to ensure the NCC ob objectives are achieved. Uh, he'll, he'll also have a look at uh, and touch on the impact of changes taking place on, in July um, via the uh, building code and uh, the impact on uh, building practitioners. Uh, so on that note, I'd uh, like to welcome uh, Dr. Wing Po. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you all for tuning in this masterclass. Um, it's just encouraging to see so many interests and uh, all tuning in at the same time this live masterclass. Today, I'm going to be talking about performance solutions and in particular, how you as practitioner may lay a good foundation to ensure um, success of your design. Um, Previously, VBA has run a number of seminars or webinars on performance solutions, discovered the regulatory 
aspect of it, how do you ensure compliance and also the requirements to achieve compliance through performance requirements or performance solution. Um, if you're interested in that, you can tune into our YouTube channel. I have provided some links at the bottom of the screen, but perhaps might be easier in just look when into the YouTube uh, channel and then type in VBA performance solution and you'll find those webinars where you can watch. Today, I'm going to take a different perspective. I'm going to look at performance design at a different, different angle from a building, a building practitioner perspective. Um, go through the background, why and how uh, you, what you want to achieve and how you want to achieve those, those objectives and um, the aims of your design. And I'll go through the how in terms of the master class. So um, in this webinar, it will be very high level, just a lot of graphics, not many texts and no equation. So, uh, and I know, I mean, you realize this, this webinar is very much focused on fire, but um, you may apply the same principle to other discipline, whether you do structure, mechanical, electrical, or other system or plumbing for that matter. Um, it's the same principle that applies. I'm going to go through some of the traps some of the tips and some of the tricks that you may apply to your design. Um, depends on what practitioner you are. You could be a builder, could be a designer, could be a regulator, could be a approval, could be a building surveyor. And you can apply this principle in terms of reading a, a report, or reviewing a report or approval. Um, I created this principle for this class called the BCA principle, something that easy easy for you to remember. The three, the three um, pressure points, if you like, uh, is about balance, about coverage and assumptions. I'll go through that in detail, but um, just keep that in mind for now. And um, later I will go through that um, in, in, in greater detail and almost step by step. And, and lastly, I'm gonna talk about what's coming up in this July, uh, which is relevant to this talk. And obviously we're going to leave some time for some question and answer. So this, this um, presentation, this class will go for about 40 minutes and then we'll leave time at the end for question and answer. Now, what is performance solution? We talk about this for a long time, for almost 25 years, 20, performance solution. It was introduced in 1996 into the BCA as a pathway. Before that was prescriptive approach, and then you come up with an alternative solution when it was proposed. So figure on the right, show you the two pathways that seem to satisfy provision with a prescriptive approach. And 25 years ago, it was introduced as alternative solutions. There were other names called, or go by other names, engineering solution, fire engineering approach, risk management approach, uh, risk assessment approach, and, and various other combination of those terms. So just bear that in mind, those things we're talking about all point towards performance solution that we, we are referring to right now. So the question you may ask is, has there been performance solution before 1996? Um, the quick answer to that is yes, they were performance solution, although we may not realize the performance solution will apply it. I'll go through some of this in a moment. So go back to the late 1980s. That was a time when I first joined BHP research as a young research engineer. And there was already a program. There was already a series of tests um, and programs already underway. Um, those were dealing with car park designs. So what you see on the screen here you know, on the left, that is what was set up. There was a first series of tests conducted on the open deck car park. So, and on the right, you can see some photographs of the actual structure and during the fire. So there was fire tests conducted, the measurements were taken and so on. So then it went on further. The test was um, the structure, same structure, 
was modified to close it up, look at closed car park situation, sprinkler and sprinkler and so on. And, um, and then the structure was further extended to include uh, office and F office enclosure above. And that was partially opened or if you like partially closed and there were further tests conducted. And then later, the fire tests were also conducted on the office enclosure above and to see how, how different compartment fires behave and, and um, there are other investigations as well. So what was the outcome of that research? It, they were actually adopted, adopted into the BCA. So they became DTS provision. So if now it still remains there in the BCA. So we look at specification C1.1, uh, looking at the, the car park design, which is um, clause, clauses 3.9, 4.2 and 5.2, and the corresponding table shown on the right, um, the FRL and so on. Those were actually engine, fire engineering solution. In today's term, we call them performance solution. So it was quite interesting you actually, if you apply that, you're actually applying performance solution. You may or may not realize, but that is what happened. Um, and then of course, there's uh, protection for support of another part, talking about fire in different compartments of clause 2.2. Those were also some parts of it were also outcome of this research. So we apply that, you also apply performance solution. That was before 1996. And in the, in the early 1990s, there was another uh, major development that was um, um, 140 William Street. Um, some of you have probably heard many, many times about this case. There was a big fire test conducted um, and basically um, comprehensive risk assessment. Um, the, the, the background of this was, um, this building, the steel structure were protected as asbestos fire protection and was to, to be removed. The question is, can we use unprotected steel? At that time, it was proposed to use unprotected steel beams and floor slab. Um, the question is, um, is, that, is that okay? Is that, is that satisfy the requirements? So this test was conducted and attracted international attention. That was a landmark case. Um, so there were two distinct approaches already before 1996. One is performance solution became standard solution in BCA as DTS provision. On the other hand, there was this going through the building referee board and came up with a unique, unique special, um, special solution or special design uh, for a building. So around the same time, there was um, Warren Center project. Uh, you probably heard of Warren Center project recently, but this was the first one, first one on fire engineering. At that time, fire engineering is not um, considered a discipline yet. So the title of that research was called Fire Safety and Engineering. So it was a very conceptual um, time that thinking through what fire safety is and going through very fundamental. And at that time, it's basically link fire safety design and engineering, put them together. So fire engineering equal engineering, uh, sorry, fire safety equal engineering discipline or responsibility. So that was a, 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 a significant advance um, and also build up the concept of the current safety level to be maintained. If you go down the route of engineering, what should the fire safety levels be? That time the argument is what's, what's the current level, which means the level of fire safety afforded by the DDS provisions of prescribed solution at the time should be maintained. Should you go down to the engineering route? And there were other recommendations in that report uh, it's about development of risk-based model, fire engine research, development, education, and training. Um, shortly after that, in 1991, there was a big reform, talking about reform, um, actually macroeconomy reform in terms of the building industry. 
um, it looks into the risks and costs, looking at the approach, looking at the risk assessment approach, and also talk about national consistent fire safety code. Shortly after that, in 1994, um, a big project uh, program was developed uh, called Fire Code Reform Center Projects. There were five projects initially. The, the last one, six ones, was um, included later um, as a later addition. So this project ranged from the BCA structure through to design solution guides and all um, and so on. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about project one and project five um, in this in this class or in this webinar. So keep that in mind. Um, project five, the major outcome or delivery was this finding guidelines, what we heard about finding guidelines. Uh, that is actually the direct outcome of the project five or rather project five A. It introduces the concept of fire design or building design as a fire safety system. So it introduces system approach and it divide or divide the system into six subsystems. So I'm going to talk about this a bit later as well. So keep this picture in your mind, this mental picture, because we will come back, come back to these uh, systems and subsystems. Um, so go, uh, continue on, on the development in 1995. Um, the BCC, the Building Control Commission, which was the predecessor of BBA, um, start planning to how to implement this performance-based solution. It's funny enough, um, I recently um, tidy up my archive boxes, did a bit of move and so on, and I find a piece of paper, which is quite interesting. That piece of paper is support, uh, it's actually turned out to be an agenda of that meeting that we discussed, how do we implement performance solution in Victoria? Um, so if you zoom in and you see, um, there you go, item number nine, there's a performance fire code reform center output, uh, project one and project five. I thought, ah, oh, this is interesting because we're going to talk about that. Uh, um, that very topic in this webinar, and I have to I present a project one, and Peter Johnson presented um, five A, which is the fire engine guidelines. Uh, you might be, you might see other names in there. You got Professor Von Beck uh, further up. Uh, he actually was the one who led the Warren Center project, the first one. So, and you can see other names there. So that was a very exciting time that we look at how do we implement fire code reform, uh, sorry, implement the performance code. Um, and in 1996, this came in, there was discussion about education, training, and, and so on. Um, so in 1996, that was um, implemented. And that was 25 years ago. So a bit of history, a bit of, um, a bit of background. Now, Fast forward 25 years, that was quarter of century. Um, has it been a success? Has it been a failure? These are the questions we ask. So um, at the same time, recently, there were many things uh, going on, a review, we got the confidence report, Warren Center project, the second one also being carried out. And uh, this ABCV have implementation program and so on. So. Well, it's the time to come back and reflect. Reflect what has it they've been for 25 years. Have we done the right thing? Have we missed the point? Um, and then plan to move forward. So I'll go through those points very quickly and then uh, I'll move on to, to what, when, uh, what, why, and how. Success, successes. Um, for the past 25 years, has there been such, um, successes in the performance design? 
if you go around the city, walk around, look at large building, complex buildings, some of them, I look at them and say, wow, they were very good, well designed. And you think back, it would not have been possible without performance solution. The, a, the BCA or NCC, now we call it, would not be designed or written to cater for this kind of buildings, right? When it works well, everything works together. It's just like a piece of machinery that, that works, works well together. So those were definitely were success in performance design. Um, in 2012, uh, ABCB commissioned this report shown on the right about the benefits of building regulatory reform. Um, I forgot to mention uh, a lot of slide. I put in some of the links, the website link that you can download these documents to read. So including the previous ones, you might have seen this blue text on bottom. Um, you can follow those or you basically simple search, Google search and you'll find those documents if you're interested. You can go back and um, I read the reports in detail. In that report, it talked about cost savings. So this is the initial one that I'm talking about macroeconomic reform, talk about safety versus cost and um, whether there's a net benefit. In that report, it's quite interesting. It talks about um, the total national benefits is $1.1 billion a year for Australia. That is a cumulative amount. And um, um, so from the cost viewpoint, that is also a benefit. So apart from flexibility, uh, there's also cost, uh, cost benefit. Now, how about failures? Um, obviously in any system, there's always a fair share of failures. VBA, have conducted many audits and inspections. And in these audits inspection, they review finding reports and they identify some are not done very well. Some the departures were not identified, not addressed. Some were identified not properly addressed. And some were sort of addressed in isolation and leave some related issues not addressed and some of them relating to construction, uh, which is inconsistent from what is recommended and so on. So I'm sure you can also um, identify or in your experience that, um, yeah, there's some um, areas that much to be desired. So, um, so overall, what is a success or failure? Uh, I guess um, everybody can write a different report card. Um, whether we're taking two steps forward and one step back and and so on. And where should, what should we do? Should we go two steps forward again? Um, and those kind of questions that probably we'll also think about. Um, 2018, there was this building conference report or sugar wheel study or report um, being released. That, that was a very comprehensive study or review of the construction industry generally start from beginning to the end end and end to end process not just performance solutions so that that is a, again a, a very good study that um, you can download and have a read and it came out with 24 recommendations and two of them were directly relating to performance solution that's number 14 talk about documentation of performance solution Number 15, talking about approval of performance solution. And um, much around the same time, maybe slightly later, there was this Warren Center project that um, looked into the fire safety engineering. This is the second one, right? So now after 25 years or, or um, fire engineering become a discipline. So now this looking at this discipline, the professionalism, of this discipline and it goes through again from the whole range of issues eight reports were re re has been released uh, ranging from the education regulation methods through to accreditation again you can 
you can search this from um, on your internet and download these eight reports. Um, if you do not wish to read all, then read the final report. This is number eight. And it gives you 30, 30 recommendations. So there's a lot of things going on, how to improve, how to lift the professionalism in this area. VBA is a major sponsor of this project. So we um, will be looking at this and implement some of this because some of them have to be implemented by other other parts as well. So this is a collaborative um, effort to to um, bring this forward. ABCB um, recently or last year, 2020, also have this program in place. Um, this is to implement the building confidence report um, and develop a national framework because this is not state <coughs> only. Excuse me. <coughs> And so far, there were 10 discussions papers um, issue on aspect of it. Um, because there are 24 recommendations, so it went through some in combination, some are separate. So again, I put some links, uh, a link at the bottom here. You may download and download all the records and, and read through. So, so you can see, uh, up to now, I will discuss, there's a lot going on. It's, it's quite exciting. It's almost back to the time that we discussed uh, the reform in the industry, how do we move forward? It almost had that feeling again. There's a lot going on. So um, we need to reflect and thinking, how do we do this better? How do we have this performance design? Go back to the basic. How do we build this foundation? I mean, we learn, we learn from the success, we learn from the failure. How do we do this? So I'm going to talk to her what? I'm going to talk to her how. And again, I'll come back to the three pressure points that I identify um, in terms of the design, right? So this 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 um, this webinar is focused on this front end of it. So obviously you've got design, construction. Um, certification, those could be potentially other, other um, master classes, but for this one, I'm going to focus. So to ensure we build a good foundation to build our design and move forward from that. So on that note, I'll, I'll, I'll go through. So the first question, what it is a very simple question. What must building be designed to achieve um, in terms of fire safety? Right, so this is this is almost like the first question you we we ask ourselves. Now, <clears throat> BCA set up objectives. There are quite a number of them. Now there's six in the guide to the BCA. You, you have shown that right. So you can go through. Um, the, all the number will be O one, O O two, and so on. All stand for objectives. Right. So these are the objectives. And I list them down in this slide, and I thought I highlight those that directly um, relating to fire. Some are there indirect, so I, so I, I left them um, like, okay, they are not as direct, but I highlight the direct ones. So there are quite a, a number of those. Um, don't be fooled by the numbers. BCA is a lot of it is fire, fire safety. So it's not a direct reflection of what the proportion of fire safety matters are covered by the um, BCA. In fact, in the past, we estimated about 75% of the BCA requirements are relating to fire safety. So it's a major component of it. Um, so I make a quick summary. This is a very big summary because there are so many. So I summarize into three. Um, objectives, um, fire safety objective. The first one is occupant safety. So that is the highest order, if you like. Um, and then the second one is facilitating firefighting. And the third one is to avoid spread of fire spread and or damage to other buildings. So these are the two aspects of uh, protection of adjacent property, if you like. So you can actually split this up into more but I thought for the ease of understanding 
and keep something in your mind, three is a good number so that we don't um, get confused or lost into the details. So three, I, I put down three. Um, now, then the next question, how are the objectives at the moment in the BCA um, covered? Covered and make sure is satisfied. The BCA, the way is, is written or is a structure is, um, I think you still can see this in the, um, the guide to the BCA. I think it's taken out from, in the past it was shown as a pyramid and it's, I maintain that structure to, just for demonstration. So you go objectives and they come to, to multiple functional statements and then it branches out into performance requirements and it branches out into DTS provisions. So this pyramidal structure, right? So the concept is if you satisfy all the performance requirements, you satisfy the objective. So it's a very simple concept. So there was this guidance level and this compliance level. So if you satisfy performance requirement, that's what you need to do. This is now what they call performance solution or performance design. So, um, and what levels of safety do we need to, to achieve? So if you go back to the first Warren Center report and the recommendation, it says the current levels of fire safety should be maintained. Um, what does that mean? We'll come to that later. And interestingly, also reflected now in Schedule 7 that is um, relating to, to verification method. And in the section, um, there are a couple of sections in there, give a very good overview, the first couple of sections. Um, and I pick up a few points there, just one point that it actually make that point a couple of times. It says the level of safety achieved by building design must be at least equivalent to the relevant DTS provisions, right? So what does that mean? So this come back to the first pressure point I'm talking about, balance. So I take put that on the top right-hand corner, balance. Um, what does that mean? That means if you come out with a performance solution, you put in this scale, if you have a scale that could measure fire safety level, it should weigh the same as a DTS solution. So it's balanced, right? So that's what it means. Um, if your, your performance solution is lighter, is less, the safety level is lower, that is unacceptable. If it's heavier, that is fine. That is what is intended. So it should be at least equal, right? But problems that we're talking about, some of the common problems that we observe from audit and inspection, some of that increased travel distance significantly reduce the number of stairs, reduce fire protection, reduce FRL, and just keep reducing. The, the outcome is the performance solution, the safety level. Now it's much, much lighter. Uh, that, um, so what you should do yeah, as a general principle, uh, I will say this to, to clients, to design team, what is removed must be properly balanced by additional or enhancement of other systems. So if you, if you got, you remove something, put something back to maintain that balance. Otherwise there is imbalance. If you increase the travel distance, the effect of it is you increase travel time. You must find the time. You must find the time some way. You might have early detection to reduce the travel time, or you increase something else to increase the time for tenability. That's what we call in fine engineering A set, R set, and A set, R set balance up. So if you, if you reduce the protection to your um, structure system, reduce the say reduce a passive system, you might balance it with, with, with active system, right? So those kinds of balance. So, so that is principle number one that I point out, balance. Ensure your building or your design achieve that balance, right? So the BCSA, uh, to the degree necessary. Um, you ask what's degree necessary? I would say 
degree necessary to maintain that balance. So the next point, coverage, right? Um, what, um, go back to this picture that we've shown before, uh, the pyramidal structure. In your mind, you might think that objectives trigger down to functional statement, to re performance requirement, to so on. They are all nicely set up. They are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So you satisfy everything, you satisfy the top level, but is that the case? In, in the actual structure, it's quite far from what you may imagine. In Fire Code Reform Center Project 1, which I mentioned much earlier, I said I'm going to talk about this later, that this structure is actually quite complicated. And I show this red line just, just schematically, right? So you're thinking, okay, you've got performance requirement one, you've got a couple of DTS provision relating to it is independent of other performance requirements that those relating to, but that is not the case. In fact, we, project one, we went through this in great, great detail. We spent months and months divide, um, basically take the BCA, tear it apart into tiny bits and pieces. And we have, in fact, we came out with um, 17 safety elements, not the six one, the six system that we talk about in project five, but there were 17 of them and 500 plus um, building ID. So this big matrix, if you think about it, is about um, 9,000 cells. And in that cells, we got BCA objectives, BCA, um, D DTS, and we, we put them together and try to see where they can make them mutually exclusive, right? Um, we can't, we couldn't, and it's so complicated, it's so interlinked. So that lies a fundamental, what does that mean, right? So if you've got an objective, you've got this structure, you've got another objective, you try to achieve both, you put them together, you see their overlaps, and you've got another objective. And then you put them together. You can see further overlaps. And um, you're thinking, okay, that was that was a top-down structure. Now you want to go to bottom up. Just look at one provision and see, hmm, is that only affecting itself or affecting multiple? In fact, it affect multiple uh, performance requirements and, and objectives. You move to another place, you look at another one. Again, same thing happening. So you move to another place and again, um, other, other performance requirements actually start to start to kick in. So there lies the next question. How do you ensure full coverage then? If you, you would say they are all interlinked, how do you ensure coverage? If you've got only one issue, that is not a problem. It's quite easy to, to work that out. But if you've got many issues, and this is where you need a good system, right, to ensure full coverage. If you haven't got that system, something may got missed. So I put down as a, as a trick. Um, in fact, you might implement as something you do all the time. In fact, in the past practice, I, I, I actually do this all the time. I, um, I'll, I'll go through it a bit later, is to develop a fire safety strategy. I think, I think the BCA also mentioned that if you develop a performance-based design brief, you should include a fire safety strategy. I'll, I'll go to that uh, and explain what I mean by what I've shown on the slide, the couple of dot points, I'll go through that in a bit more detail. So the first thing I did, in fact, I advise that everybody does as well, is to make the objectives. The three things that we say we're going to, to achieve, the three objectives make into a dimension in your, in your strategy. So that is the what, what you want to achieve, right? So then go back to the mental picture that you store in your mind about project six, fire safe uh, fire engine guidelines, the six subsystems. So this is uh, number one to six, I'll let you read. It starts from um, fire initiation down to fire brigade response and anything in between. So all the six subsystems, 
Um, if you read the current IFAC or Inter International Finding Guideline, which is produced some years later, um, about 10, almost 10 years, same system or same subsystems are introduced. The title, the name was slightly changed and it included these icons. Um, and instead of calling one to six, we call A to F. Um, if you um, look at looking forward a little bit at the moment, ABCB is reviewing or considering publishing this Australian finding guideline, which is the next version of the IFAC. Um, um, I think this may be going to be released second half of the year. It's also maintained that subsystem, A to F, six of them. And, and what you do, you take those six subsystems, pick, make it another dimension. This is the how. How do you achieve those objectives, right? So if you like, if you write, this is this is sort of a, a visual map, but when you write the the strategy, each of them, what what I did is each of them is a subheading, right? So uh, subsystem uh, subsystem A, B, C, and each one, uh, what you do and how do you achieve the objective? So you basically go through one by one and weave it through, weave it through through the the objectives to ensure you got this full coverage, right? This is something that I always check like, okay, have I covered objective one, objective two through using subsystem A. And if I move uh, a passive system to active system, I mean, sure it's, it's covered. And um, what if you have other objectives, right? Um, something that people may not realize, BC objective, only three objectives. There could be other objectives. Sometimes you ask a client, say, do you want to protect your building? That is not a BC objective. Do you want to uh, protect your, your content? Uh, very expensive content, artwork or, or equipment and all that. This not as well. So what you do, you include, include this and then weave it through again. And, um, and then lastly, superimpose your, your, your performance solution in there and then you can see um, whether you got full coverage or not so you got a what and what uh, what and how you may also imp um, super inspire another dimension of why so you, that that will lift it up again say why do we do this why do you do that that will be the uh, uh, comprehensive uh, strategy i'll move on a bit quicker uh, almost to the end now um, the last one, assumptions. Now, this is the most critical um, or, or more, most, most tricky. Assumptions are necessary because we don't know the, we don't know everything, right? It's a foundation of the design. If you got the assumptions wrong, your design could be wrong. So you must treat the, the assumption with respect. It's about building, about occupants, about materials, all those leaves are on the right, the fire scenario, analytical model and so on. These are all the assumptions that need to be made to make your, your, your design possible. So my advice is seek out the information through documentation. If you've got existing building conduct site inspection and all that, you ask, ask, ask the design team, ask anybody there. You can sort out the knowns and unknowns. And you might need review, you might need peer review to check your assumptions, right? So don't, but there are a few things you shouldn't assume. You shouldn't assume the client, the design team fully understand um, the BC objectives. You probably need to explain to them, some of them may or may not realize the limitation of the BCA objectives and the implication of design and output. And don't assume things won't change. I mean, for start of the project, that, that could be the case or start of the building, that could be the case, but at the end, uh, after some number of years, they may change. So um, a quick recap of the three principle, right? It's basically quite simple. If you, if you keep that in your mind, it, you'll probably have a good foundation to move forward. The balance, coverage, and assumptions. I'm talking about fire engineering or fire safety design, but you could use this method, right? To, to strategize for review. If you are building surveyor, 
you can ask like, have you covered this? Have you covered that? You've got this mental picture in your mind. You probably um, also have a good system to review the design for approval for, as I mentioned down there, fire, non-fire system. So lastly, I'm gonna cover before we, we I'm going to go through this very quickly so we can leave some time for question and answer. Um, what's changing coming, what changes are coming up that affect what we're talking about? The first one is 1st of July. It's mandatory now to prepare a, a, a brief, the FBDB. Now that is no longer an optional. You, if, you, uh, if you conduct a performance design, you must do that. So from that, what I talk about, ABC, uh, DC principle, you can apply to that for your next design or your next review of the report. Um, what else? This professional engineers registration act will kick in 1st of July. So for engineers, your RBP will be, oh, currently you are registered with B VBA, you'll be transferred to Consumer Affairs Victoria, the business licensing authority is endorsed by engineers and the relevant section of the building act will be amended accordingly. Um, what else? Um, amendments in plumbing regulation, routine servicing of plumbing work is, is uh, of fire safety equipment, is plumbing work and must be appropriately done by appropriate registered practitioner. Um, and that will take in slightly later, 30 days later in the July. So that basically very quickly cover um, my presentation and thank you all for attending and listening. And we open for question and answer. I'll hand that back to Andrew and you, you facilitate this part. Uh, thanks, Wing. Uh, so hopefully everyone found that of, um, of great use. I think um, from my perspective, um, my experiences um, through the cladding safety audit um, process uh, and looking at some of the, uh, and I must admit, bad examples of um, design. Um, we, we had the opportunity to have a look at some of the performance um, solutions uh, being documented. Um, and I think uh, a number of the items that uh, Wang has sort of touched on are uh, demonstrated uh, in uh, the poor practices by some um, around the assumptions they've made um, the um, lack of holistic design, so the ability to um, review the building in its entirety and um, and look at that balance that um, Wing um, mentioned around ensuring that we've got um, uh, we we pass the pub test really that um, if uh, deemed to satisfy our solution is. Um, uh, at one end of the, the scale and then your performance solution has taken out so many provisions of the NCC um, that it just doesn't feel right and um, that's what we've seen with a lot of buildings that I think unfortunately performance solutions haven't been utilised for their correct purpose um, in, in some cases and they have evolved to be a, um, a cost cutting or a solution method uh, to to get across uh, design flaws or construction flaws during the process. So that's something I think we all need to be really conscious of that um, uh, there is a process, there needs to be more rigor around that process that um, performance solutions are here to stay. It's a fairly strong um, philosophy for ABCB. And, um, and if we all undertake the correct steps and processes in that, I think um, they, they will achieve what they, they originally were designed to do. And that was um, to provide some flexibility that um, the deemed satisfy is, is sort of the, the black box that um, is for a um, standard type building design. Um, buildings obviously are very variable, have different uh, situations and conditions that need to be considered and Perform solutions allow you to interpolate uh, that and be able to cater specifically for the building, but it is um, it, it is um, potentially abused, and that's where um, I think more sessions like this and more discussion uh, with uh, industry as a whole around what is acceptable, what's not acceptable, and how you actually step through the, um, the decision-making process and the approval process will will assist with um, getting more consistency out of that. So thank you, Wing, for your presentation. Um, we've got um, about 10 minutes to 
uh, answer some questions and we've got a, a heap of those uh, coming through. So thank you for those. Uh, we'll try and answer as many as we can. Um, I think uh, we might, might sort of start with um, uh, weighing about maintaining balance. Uh, are there any situations where you can take out something without putting something back? That, that's a good question. Can we take something out without putting something back um, in? If, if the, something that you take out has, is weightless, if I put it that way, then yes. That means something that does not impact on safety. If you take it out, then um, you, you, if you don't put it back, it's still maintain that balance. Or something that the requirement is so excessive then you take it out, it does not impact on safety. For for example, if you've got um, DDS requirement that require a four hour FRL that may be meant for other applications, right? So that is, if you, if you reduce it three hours for two hours, it still does not impact on the safety. Then if you take that out, in that case, you, you may not need to put it back. So that will be the only situation. But others that if you take it out and affect safety, then you have to put something back. So I guess that, that is a very, very uh, simple, simplistic view, but you probably need to look at it. And some of them are just um, technical non-compliance, maybe is misread or, or the requirement that the, uh, the compliance is read in a different light that if you don't do it the way that it's written, it probably still doesn't affect the outcome. So those situations, yes, you could. So that, that's a quick answer. Um, we might need to dwell a bit more. Thanks, Wayne. Um, I'll ask you to have a look at some of those questions too and, and pick out um, some questions that you might like to answer. Uh, in the meantime, I might uh, answer one. Uh, what is the design obligation for the provision of escape for disabled persons in two plus storey buildings? Um, so good question. Um, and I think it's one that uh, we all struggle with. Um, so the, the current de deemed to satisfy provisions don't prescribe accessible solutions for occupants uh, with a dis disability. And uh, despite that being um, mandatory under the performance requirements that uh, that requires exits and warnings being appropriate to the number of mobility and, and characteristics of the occupants. So there is a bit of a mismatch between the performance provisions and the um, and the deemed satisfy. And I think um, ABCB have recognised that. Um, they've deliberated over this for a, a number of years. Uh, they did develop a non-regulatory handbook for lifts used during evacuation and, and that never became a um, sort of ratified document because of the, the number of unknowns in that space that uh, obviously lifts uh, operating in the event of a fire have a number of um, concerns on their their operation and the, the risks around someone being trapped in that lift so that that really needs to be um, considered carefully and, and that handbook um, gives guidance around those sort of things. Um, and, and so I think where we're at currently is that we rely on building management practices to meet the needs of, of occupants with a disability for emergency egress. Um, and these are obviously outside the scope of the NCC, um, but are recognised often under the um, Occupational Health and Safety legislation. Um, and um, uh, but that they, those measures, those building management measures are often reliant on occupants with a disability making themselves known to the, the building managers. And uh, that's often difficult or, or seen as inequitable in itself. Um, so I think, I think there is an obligation on designers um, uh, under that uh, h &S legislation as well, that they should be thinking about um, how they cater for people with disability. Um, uh, it's not one that's been tested to date because there, there is that, um, as I mentioned, that the DTS doesn't cover it. Uh, so if you, you meet the DTS, then strictly speaking, you comply. Um, but there are often designs that I've seen over the years where they will look at refuge areas within um, fire ice ladder stairs and, and other options of um, providing at least some consideration for people with a disability, um, a vision alarms to to cater for those with um, hearing loss uh, and those sort of things. 
Uh, when did you have a, any question that there that you'd like to take? cover? Um, I can probably address another one. Um, do you think that the insurance industry has factored performance designs into the high, high price and or unavailability of insurance? Um, I think it, the, my, my opinion is that the insurance industry has really looked at failures rather than performance solutions in themselves. Um, I don't know whether they've um, appreciated performance designs as being a, a potentially a higher risk um, area. I think uh, the, the question is probably coming from the perception that uh, some of these buildings with performance designs are the ones that are actually um, failing as well, that, that performance solutions haven't been appropriately documented or, or approved in the process. Uh, so I think that's, um, I don't think insurers themselves though, look uh, necessarily at performance solutions and price that into the insurance. I think it all comes back to the number of claims uh, and, um, and that uh, really affects their premiums. Uh, Wayne, did you have one that you'd like to answer? Um, I think there's one, I've, I've lost it. I think it's about who is responsible for identifying the non-compliance. Um, I think they talk about whether it's fire engineers or building surveyor. Um, that, that is an interesting one. Um, the IFAC at the moment put it as the building surveyor relevant, the authority having jurisdiction to identify the performance or the deviation. Um, whilst the AFAC, I think it says, um, I think it's more collaboratively, which I believe should be the case. Um, the building surveyor um, would be the one who collected, but actually to identify it, you need the relevant designers to identify. If you've got non-compliance of the mechanical system, the mechanical engineers identify the structure system, um, the structure engineers identify it and inform the building surveyor. I see this being a collaborative process rather than give everything to the relevant building surveyor or the art building authority and say, okay, find out the non-compliances that would be impractical, uh, would be quite difficult to achieve. So I would say it's a collaborative approach. It's a team, after all design is a team approach. Thanks Wayne. Um... I've got one here. Uh, would you consider persons preparing performance solutions who are being paid by the persons who have a vested interest in a particular outcome have a conflict of interest? It would seem to be the case. There is a lot of pressure put on fire engineers to design solutions to fit the design. Um, so I think that's probably got a number of facets to that, that question. Um, like uh, you would hope that designers and especially engineers under their um, professionalism and ethics would be, uh, and, and their duty of care, would be uh, nominating designs that are appropriate and um, are defendable from a perspective of um, a performance solution and justification. Um, the, the system does allow those designers to present those performance solutions, uh, but it's then uh, up to the relevant building surveyor to actually assess those performance solutions and confirm that uh, there's been adequate justification on those performance solutions and <clears throat> where they um, I don't believe they've got the expertise, then they should be calling on uh, appropriate expertise to assist them with that decision making. So I think um, that goes back to some of the points in Wing's um, presentation around assumptions and conditions that uh, a number of performance solutions that we've seen documented have had assumptions that um, were clearly incorrect for the building um, and should have been fairly easy for the building surveyor to pick that up in the process uh, and conditions on what was required in the building. So they had additional provisions to be provided in the building that weren't uh, then represented on the design documentation. So those sort of things really shouldn't be occurring that, um, uh, and I think there is a false sense of security in the building surveying profession around fire engineers, engineers documenting it and not having to check it, that uh, they can rely on that. But the, the legislation doesn't um, provide for reliance uh, within that performance solution, um, unless it's an independent uh, certification that you're actually getting. Uh, so yeah, it is important for building surveyors to uh, appropriately consider those performance solutions and um, 
uh, and, and then query those where they have concerns uh, back with the designers. Uh, Wayne, did you have uh, another one you'd um, like to answer? Yeah, we, we probably are going to run out of time. There are quite a lot uh, of yeah. questions yep. that uh, there's been asked. Probably I'll answer the simplest one. Will AFAC replace IFAC? I think the answer is yes. So, so yeah, thanks, Wayne. One. No, that's good. Uh, yeah, apologies, we have run out of time and there are a number of other questions uh, that would have been good to try and get to, but um, I appreciate your time this afternoon um, and I hope you've enjoyed this and, um, and gained something from it. Um, please um, uh, keep an eye out on our website for more events and um, uh, I think our next one is um, a VBA bushfire audit presentation. Uh, so we've actually uh, done some undertaken some auditing within the bushfire uh, areas, uh, looking at uh, documentation, and um, we'll be presenting some of the findings from that and uh, some of the learnings that uh, hopefully practitioners uh, can take on board and uh, improve uh, their, their documentation. Um, so uh, once again, uh, these uh, pre this presentation is recorded and um, it can be found on uh, our YouTube channel, I think, in, in the ne next few weeks. Um, uh, I think it'll probably be up early next week. And um, uh, we have other education resources also that uh, we're posting uh, via that uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so thank you once again, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Thank you.